Okay. We are holding here in the Gemara in Mesechta Megillah, Daf Chavav Amir Aleph 26a. Our Gemara gets into a lot of, you could say, touchy discussions. Who owns a shul? Could a shul be sold? Even back then, it was a very common thing. This picture, I'm sure, uh, okay, this is a picture of one of the most famous shoals in the world. Pride, the right? oldest shoal outside of Israel, in Prague, right? which is Altamir Shoal. It's called the Old New Shoal in Prague. Yep, very famous. In, mm -hmm. in Prague. Prague. Moral of Prague was a Ravina that shoal was built about 500 years before him. He was by uncle, by they say it has stones from the Holy Temple, from the base of Mikdash, built yeah. inside of it. The golems in the attic on top of the Aron Kodesh, on top of the Holy Ark. This shul, anybody recognize this shul over here? Some old Pittsburgh old timers might recognize it. <laughs> Anyone recognize this, this shul? Um, is this, um, uh, you might recognize it like this. It looks like this nowadays. That's Murray Avenue. That's, a, that's the parking lot of Giant Eagle. Uh -huh. And where is it? Where is it? It used to be a shul over there called the Chafetz Chaim Shul. See is the that shul? It says, today? Now it's a parking lot of Giant Eagle. Was there Pittsburgh? <laughs> See the shul called Chafetz Chaim Congregation? It was uh, organized in 1925. The second floor of a building in the corner of Murray and Phillips. The Rav was Rabbi Aaron Ashinsky. Um, 1929, they bought this house to be used as a shul in a social hall. It had up to about 100 families. And in 1972, it was only about 15 members left. And then it disbanded. It was bought by Giant Eagle, and now it's part of the parking lot of Giant Eagle. And Rabbi Pukka was the grand nephew of the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim's last name was Pukka. All right. Was it, wasn't that a did Pittsburgh Rebbe had a shul there? Pittsburgh Rebbe had a shul, I think, on Douglas Street in his house. So this is the Chavetz Chaim shul. Unfortunately, now you see what it is. It's, it's no longer a shul. It's now just a parking lot. Parking lot. Could a shul become a parking lot? Mm. What type of shul could become a parking lot? <laughs> Maybe some shuls, yes, some shuls not. Uh, we're right now, you, it's part of the um, uh, JSF, I think Jewish Family Services, JFS, uh, right next to Weinberg Terrace on Bartlett Street. It used to be the Russian shul. Uh, I'm sure it used to be right next door to Mr. Nidich, right? Remember the Russian shul next door? The Russian shul used to be there in the Russian shul. Now it's part of the JFS. Right, so that was that is no longer a shul. So the Kotel moved to another building, a, a newer building. So at least that shul uh, upgraded. Mm -hmm. The Russian shul itself, you know, it's it's uh, no longer a shul, but it's being used as a communal building. Mm -hmm. Same question applies: Could a shul ever be sold? Could a shul, by necessity, communities change? Shuls have to be sold. So what is the din? What is the halacha? So let's have a look inside the Gemara. Well, the interesting thing for this shul, mm -hmm. they didn't sell it. Baruch Hashem, this shul over here, we are in B'nai Muna, currently was not sold, and Baruch Hashem stayed a shul, and now the shul is growing and expanding and building, and etc. Mm -hmm. Where I lived in East Flatbush, the whole neighborhood was full of shuls. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of them, unfortunately, today have uh, served different congregations, you know, not Jewish yeah. congregations. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's four things a shul can never be sold for. One of them is a base of Oedazara, a house of idol worship. That would include a mosque. But also a mosque. Even though a mosque is not idol worship, but it, it, it's not the idea of just idol worship. It's the idea of serving anything but Hashem. Oh. Well, unfortunately, I've seen shuls that have turned into churches. It's very common, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 There is, you cannot sell it as a place of immorality. So if you're going to be mixed dancing there, a nightclub or something like that, you cannot sell it for that. Or anything that's going to be smelly, for example, a landfill, a tannery, or things like that. So it goes to a third owner? Is that how it goes? So people just aren't careful? People aren't careful of that, unfortunately, yeah. But that's the actual halacha. The so to understand if a shul, it belongs to a public, uh, does it belong to the community at large? Does it belong to certain individuals who started the shul? Does it belong to what's called the Shiva Tuve'ir, as the Gemara will discuss today, 
the board, the seven important people of the city, <laughs> or does Shul belong to the entire Jewish nation, and therefore no one has any right to sell the Shul? We tried bringing different proofs. Sorbe Eliezer, he bought a Shul in Yerushalayim that was used by the tanners of copper, the, the smelters of copper, who, was, who were, had a very um, smelly trade, and no one wanted to daven with them. They, daven, they had their own shul, and he bought it from them and used it for his own needs, for his own house. And we said, an individual shul with just a very small membership is not owned by a collective community. That could be sold for a parav type of purpose. You see from there an interesting thing, that a shul was made up of the same type of people. Meaning a shul, obviously, you cannot talk during davening, but not during davening, a shul, you're allowed to speak to each other. Otherwise, well, what's the difference who's davening in the shul? Mm -hmm. See, people the same style had their own shul. Yes? Probably the same. Because the shul we had in, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Over here, they have a very official New York State religious operation. Uh-huh. Um, and there are rules. I guess that's where you get tax exempt status. So mm -hmm. the money that comes in does not have to be declared as for income tax purposes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there you has it has to definitely there has to be an official membership. What the criteria for membership are, that the show could determine. Uh -huh. For us, we have to we have to pay membership dues and come a certain number of times a year. Then you need offices. And on top of the offices, has to be the board of directors. It's very interesting. There's a parish of Hitrick and Al uh, Shalom lived in Karnites. So there was a very big uh, conservative shul on Eastern Parkway called the Jewish Center, Brooklyn Jewish Center, which is now Al Taira. And very quietly, the Rebbe told him, You should become a member there. And don't tell anybody it comes from the Rebbe. So he became a member there. And he used to go to the pool and hang out with the people there, reading a the newspaper and chit chatting with them. And other other chassidim in Karnites were upset with him, like, "What are you doing? You know, you're you're a chassid, you're you're hanging out over there." And later on, when they wanted to sell the building and they needed um, agreement from everyone on of, of all the members, and he said, "No, we can't we can't sell it. it; has to be kept as a Jewish institution." So they eventually they sold it for much less than asking price than they could have got, and they sold it to Alitara um, Yeshiva. Now it's a cell center, a hall, and everything. But well, they think it was a conservative, so they became mm -hmm. a now it's now it's a yeshiva, yeah. Oh, wow. But it's a very large, uh, sturdy building. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of big buildings in Brooklyn that are all conservative shows. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, some of them went to be you know, what they were deserved. But a lot of them, the most of them were built by the conservative Jews. And I you know, put all the money in, and a lot of them now became the achievements. <coughs> so I came from, just came from the show where everybody having the same occupation, more or less. It's in it uh, over 55 community, mm -hmm. but basically, uh, for retire, basically everybody's retired in the 70s. So it was, uh, it's, it's just interesting to see a young person appear. You're surprised. It's about what are you doing here? <laughs> and that's why I, I belong to Anthony and me in Florida. I belong in, 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 in uh, Allendale and the Kabbalah side of South Dallas. My sister wanted a place in a senior center, senior community. You go there, it's uh, no, nothing. No, no, it's what, nobody, no, nobody talks. It's quiet. It's dead. And in these shows, the kids are running around and they make noise. Right. Uh, uh, so the next proof we tried bringing was from. Oh, it's, it's okay. We'll try going. Yeah. I mean, I have a question. I mean, sure. Someone owns. If a Jew owns a store, um, I mean, the church wants to buy it to make the church actually. Actually, that would be a lot of issue because actually they're giving you the money. They're not doing it just like that or what? Uh. So to yeah, that, that's a different. I think it's a totally different story. I, I don't think you're allowed to sell it directly to a. Summon uh, a church to, to grant it to them. You could rent it to them. You could rent it to them. I remember the Mr. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Pullman here from Pinskers. Next door, they opened up a nail salon next door to Pinskers uh, many years ago. And uh, they had all these incense and idols and stuff they were doing in there. And he forcefully, forcefully got them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he took it over. And now it's his second store. Now it's where 18 is.
uh, uh, if the church pays you money, um, a store is a you own the store. Mm -hmm. The, there's other halachas. It's a whole different mitzvah. It's called uh, you're not allowed to give chanoya bekarka. You're not allowed to give a place for right. idol worshippers to live among you. Hmm. So if you're if you don't own the property, nothing you can do about it. But if they own the if you own the property, then you could not. There's a way of not giving them a place to be. So that's a whole different hmm. ball game. The next, we try bringing the proof from the base of Mikdash. We see that Yehuda and Benjamin. Uh, they own different parts of the Beis HaMikdash. Like we brought over here, this is the entire Beis HaMikdash. The holier part, where the Kodesh Kedashim was, was owned by Shevet, in the land of Shevet Binyamin, and the lower part was in the land of Shevet Yehuda. And Binyamin really wanted to incorporate the Mizbeach, so a scrap, it says a little ritzua, a strip of land came out. Interestingly, the Medrash says that when Binyamin uh, had, was found holding the goblet that his brother Yosef planted into his uh, sack as they're leaving Mitzrayim. So all the brothers became very upset at him, very upset at the uh, Binyamin. How dare you steal? Now you're implicating all of us. You're getting us all in trouble. Uh, what's your father going to tell us? And they said they all hit Binyamin with a strap, except for Yehuda, the brother Yehuda, because he took responsibility for Binyamin. Uh, and he said, in that merit, uh, all of them lost, all the brothers lost their portion of the Beis HaMikdash, except for Yehuda. And Yehuda kept the Beis HaMikdash, except for the one strap that's called the Ritzua, the same word, strip and strap. Which, oh, which was over here, you see Yehuda and Yamin, the two sides of the Beis of the Mizbeach, right? The sides with, without the lowest level, that's called the Yisoy, the foundation, that belonged to Yehuda. And the ones with the Yisoy belonged to Binyamin. Uh, um, 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 and all of the rest of the base of you know, this... all the rest of the base of Mikdash belonged to uh, the, uh, all uh, the higher bias mm -hmm. there's two opinions it belonged to everyone collectively or to belong to just Shevet Yehuda mm -hmm. correct ah, Shalom Eichem uh, just a trivia of label. do you recognize this place? Can hear. It, uh, it, it actually closed before we came in eighty nine. I mean, so it was it was gone. Uh huh. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about the the Chafetz Chaim Shul, which is now a parking lot. Mm -hmm. So, so we tried bringing the proof from the base of Mikdash, and we said there's different opinions on the matter. Rabbi Yehonasan, Rabbi Yehuda, and but the we brought the second opinion that. No shave, no individual tribe owned the base of Mikdash. It belonged to everybody collectively, evenly. And not just that, Yerushalayim, the city was not owned by anyone. It was owned by everyone collectively, and therefore anybody could be forced to sort of stay in someone else's house. You weren't allowed to take rent for renting your house. And the Chacham and the Sages said that although the land of Yerushalayim belongs to the Jewish people collectively, but you could rent out your bed, let's say. The bed belongs to me. Mm. So even though your bed, let's say a cot, that costs you hundred dollars, but uh, well, you're not going to get three dollars a night. But you can rent it out. It, it's an area you could rent out. This is how Airbnb got started. What was the original <laughs> Airbnb? Original Airbnb. Yeah. So we learn a lesson from here. Amr Abaya Abaya says, "Shmamina." We learn from here. Oirek ara lemishpak. It's proper etiquette. Lemishpak inish gulpa umashka bushpize. It's uh, 26B2. It's proper etiquette for a person who is a guest to leave a gift for the host. From the fact that he says that the, uh, they couldn't charge for their beds, but he says the custom was to leave the hides of the, the skin, the leather of the animals that they would bring as a carbon as a gift for the host. So we see that it's proper to leave a gift for the host. And to the extent that just like in the Yerushalayim, the host was able to demand the hide, the skin from the guest. So it's almost, it's proper. It's not an actual halacha, but it's a proper thing to leave a gift for your host when you're staying there. And it's only proper saying the, the if the, let's say the, guest uh, bought an animal 
you know, he and he got meat for supper and he has leftovers, he should leave it to the host. He shouldn't take it home with him. So everything leftovers, the 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 guest should give to the host. 26 B what? 26. 26, sorry. So 26. I might like to see the article for a moment. Sure. Because we tried to look for a buy and can't find it here. <laughs> 26. I think it's 26A. 26A, uh, four. 26, four. All right, so now we're up to the last paragraph of the page, about to turn the Amin. Amar Rava, Rava says, returning to the discussion of the Mishnah, when are you allowed to sell a city uh, city square, like the square in front of the Kaisal, when you, that's used occasionally as a shoal, when are you allowed to sell a shoal, and the money has to be used uh, the, only for more an, uh, for an item of equal or holier, greater kedusha, Amar Rava Rava says, "Leishanu It's only applies when you have two criteria met. That's the only time you could sell a shul. One, if the board of the shul agreed, and we're talking about not a small shtibel. A small shtibel could be sold. We're talking about a big community shul with a lot of guests that cannot be sold. If the sh seven representatives of the city, how were they chosen? It, it was arbitrary. It could be it was chosen by elections. could be it was chosen by whoever represented the Jewish community at that time. But it wasn't a clear-cut way. They, they don't necessarily have to be the uh, seven wisest Torah scholars of the, of the city. And they don't have to be people which are the wealthiest. These are just representatives who are chosen for the city. And whatever they do, has a very strong, uh, uh, it's very strong, and as and it's considerable, it's considered that they are representing all the people of the city have done what the they were, and it's considered as if everyone in the city did it. But the second thing is that all the people of the city also have to agree that it could be sold. All, the, all the people, meaning the general consensus the general, is yeah. majority, because what happens if the board of the show decides to make a quick buck out of the show? Hmm. and uh, to sell it without having all the members involved. Hmm. So you have to have the members. I don't think it has to be unanimous, but the general consensus, all the members and the entire board, they have to be agreeable to this. And only then could they sell it and use the money to buy a new show, to purchase a new place. Or to, if you have a little small town where you don't have a board, or you never appointed representatives, so then you would only have that one condition of having the members deciding together. Now, a difference would be uh, what nowadays is, would be, let's say, a Chabad house. A Chabad house, when it's built to begin with, is a very multi-purpose place. It's not strictly a show where you daven, because we're going to soon have a lochus of a, big, of a base knesses, a show where you daven, and a base medrash, a place where you learn. It would be a very different halachas, and many of them are stricter than the other. But when the Chabad house is built to begin with, it's built on condition that it's not only for a show, it's going to be used for other things as well. So such a place has a lesser degree of sanctity and you could sell it to better, buy a better place or as things change, that could be done. A show which is built by an individual, which you have uh, many of these uh, it's called the roofs, it's like a rav of a shul, mm -hmm. a rav of a, of a community, and they have it in many circles, and that they have a large property, and they build a big shul. And they're the rabbi, but they own the shul, and they own the entire thing from A to Z. So these, so even if people give money to the shul, they're donating to the shul only because of the rabbi of the shul, only because of him. So he also has sole authority of that place. So let's say a rebbe would be like that, and we mentioned uh, in the previous year that the Rebbe in 1983 or 82, he sold 770. He sold the building to get funds for the to renovate the woman's mikveh in Kranitz. Mm -hmm. A Rebbe sold, sold the building of 770. Yeah. So they someone who so they had to pay rent. No, it was it was more of a symbolic sale. It was a hundred year lease. He said, right? No, no, no. It sold. Okay. <laughs> um, the Rebbe said that. 
you know, he, he brought up the topic a few times and nobody took action on it. So he took action on it. He could sell a show for a mikvah. And he's, he's, we don't know who bought it. They say it was someone who was not Chabad, who was uh, very connected, very close uh, to the Rebbe. And, uh, you know, he, he's not getting involved at all in anything of the show. It was more of a symbolic thing. I think it was more of a symbolic statement that was being made. So who owns it now? It's a good Chabad. That's what it says. The oh, yes. Chabad uh, uh, International. So, uh, community, large community show. Uh... The neighborhood changes and uh, gets so who, who who gets the uh, the funds from the sale? So that's uh, everything we're learning about here in the Gemara. Oh, okay. A large communal shul sales says the funds cannot go towards any uh, has to go towards another shul. Can't go towards anything else. Yeah. Uh, one discussion which was briefly touched upon, but we didn't delve into it, was. If they're able to find something for a, a cheaper price, for example, it says he could sell a shul to buy a safer tarot. So let's say they sold a shul uh, for thirty thousand dollars, and they're able to find a new safer tarot for twenty eight thousand dollars. So now, what should they do with the last two thousand dollars? So, so that they say they have to uh, doesn't could be used also for a new shul. Doesn't have to be used like I say for a new safer tarot. Doesn't because they're able to get the same thing for a cheaper price. There are, uh, in our Gemara, we have four different opinions. Rashi says that if the board of the show sold it, whatever they did is done. And if they sold it and they did it in agreement with the people of the city, even the money is not holy and the money could also be unconsecrated. Uh, the rush holds that, that, that in big cities, large shows, the funds have to go to another new large show. The Ramam holds that if they sold a shul without the permission of the board of the shul, of the seven shibituvay ear, so then the money has to be consecrated for a new shul. The money, if you sold it, uh, if and the place that you sold it could be sold for everything but four things, which we mentioned what they were. If the shul was sold with the agreement of the seven board members. Will be the board. It doesn't have to be necessarily seven. Seven is brought because throughout Tanakh you see that a king had seven advisors. Mm. So if the if they did it together, so then the Ramam says that all the money, the funds go um, towards the new show, but the place itself could be sold for anything, even for a church, even even for uh, something which is not uh, clean. And the rabbit holds that the that the shul itself can never be sold for something not respectable. So, for example, this shul Chafetz Chaim, or the the Russian shul, right? They're no longer shuls, but it's not something disrespectful. It's not a garbage dump where it is over there. A dumpster is not there. It's mm -hmm. it's a parking lot, or it's a you know Jewish family services, something like that. So that's you know not such a big deal. Uh, the place, you know, where I wasn't in, in uh, living in East Flatbush, so it was called the Congregation Agudas Achim mm. of East Flatbush. And very nice show, very nice building, and was sold to a church. But they took all the money from that show and they built a new show in Tel Aviv with the same name. And you can check it up, Agudas Achim of East Flatbush, on some street in Tel Aviv. And so what was the permission they should do it? Turned that building into a church? It wasn't. There's no permission for that. <laughs> well, well, maybe they're following the sheet of the Ravid and the, of, of the Rambam and they think that they're a small show. I don't know. Sometimes shows actually don't know what they're doing, I guess, and so that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, there's um, many shows in Crown Heights. I mean, that was the Rebbe's crusade in the 60s. Mm -hmm. All right, there was uh, there's one place I mentioned on Schenectady Avenue <laughs> where the boys from the yeshiva used to go every week and review mm -hmm. uh, Chassidus in the show between Mincha and Meir every week. Mm -hmm. And one week they come, and there's a, a new sign on the door, and there's a symbols, and it says uh, whatever church name is. What happened? We went to the house of one of the people of the, they knew in the shul, and the person said that we knew if Lubavitch finds out they're going to sell the shul, they would try stopping it. So we made sure to keep it a secret. <laughs> there's a place on. Uh, was it Lubavitch? Or was it no, no, not Lubavitch. <laughs> Parnas used to be a very uh, diverse community yeah. before it became all Lubavitch. <laughs> Another place on um, Eastern Parkway and Buffalo Avenue is a shul. Still has a big mug and David on it. 
Uh, my father's brother used to go there every weekend, you know, review Chassidus, and he was the last one to go there before it was sold also to so our church. And unfortunately, it's very common nowadays in that whole area. When the past actually had so many Orthodox shuls, which didn't have the pizzas. Right. They still call themselves Orthodox. <laughs> Correct. I mean, again, it brings in Sfarim that if there's talking going on in the shul during the evening, mm -hmm. the, then that shul could unfortunately turn into a place of the opposite of holiness. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying why anything happens, but it's just something to be very careful about. Mm -hmm. There's a big shul on the hill that you can see it as a dome. And... Where, in East Liberty? No, on the, on the hill. It's, uh, oh, in the hill district. Hill district. Uh huh. It was Kesatara. Yeah, there was no Kesatara. That was the original Kesatara. Oh, wow. So steps for the women on the outside. Uh -huh. Fine. Uh, we'll, uh, we started a rubber statement, but uh, we'll continue with the rubber statement uh, tomorrow. And we're going to talk more about Bayes Nissan. Mm. And we're going to, mainly, I'm going to talk very little. I'm going to let Rabbi uh, Danziger, Rabbi Label Estrin Sanala, do most of the talking for us. Okay. Um, it's Today is Bayes Nissan. It's a yard site that stops of the Rebbe Rashab. We learned much of his Hasidus. Over the last couple uh, years, we learned to Kuntur Sumayan. Uh, the Rebbe Rashab is called the Rambam of Hasidus for his in-depth explanations. In addition to that, the Rebbe explained how, for us, Beis Nisan, more than being the day that the Rebbe Rashab passed away, it's the beginning of the Nisias, of the leadership of the Friedrich Rebbe. And that's for us, is most important. Similar to Yitzvat, is although it's the passing of the Friedrich Rebbe, it's also the beginning of the leadership of the Rebbe, with all that it entails. So, so Beis Nisan was traditionally always a very special day in Lubavitch. I don't think there's anyone around now who still saw the Rebbe Rashab, perhaps, mm. but I don't think so. Well, when did he pass away? He passed away in the year 1920. If you remember the story I said about uh, the Chassid, who had a, um, passed away the day before. Mm. He passed away Matze Shabbos at a very young age in Rostov. You could say the Rebbe Rashab made the biggest move of, of any Rebbe, of any sort, which was moving from a town of Lubavitch, from a small town, where Hasidus was always in small towns, from Balshem all the way till then. Because of World War I, and the Rebbe Rashab saying, I cannot be by the Germans, and he ran away, he escaped from the Germans, and he went to, ended up in Rostov moving to a large city. And from there, from Rostov, it went to uh, Leningrad, Leningrad, Leningrad to Moscow, to Riga, to Warsaw, to New York City, all only big cities um, since then. And you could say sort of changed the entire direction of Chassidus, Chassidus Chabad. So we will have a little tour over the Rebbe Rishab's house in Rostov, home in Rostov, by Reb Chaim Danziger. Um, Rabbi, the, his right to his wife is Eshrin, Fred Eshrin. Uh, and show us the place where the Rebbe Rashab passed away. And by the oil uh, from a few years ago, the live stream from the oil of the Rebbe Rashab. So let me just make sure the yeah, sound is better. Of his kids by mitzvah. Yeah. He makes a beautiful, beautiful speech in fluent Russian. Now, um, talking about. Many people planned on coming to Rostov to spend a special holy day together with the local Jewish community to Farbrain to visit the Rebbe's house. I thought I'd take a few minutes to show you where the Rebbe lived, to show you the Rebbe's house, to give you a tour of the place. And in Mitzvah Shem, we look forward to hosting you and to seeing you very soon once things settle down. The house known as Bratsky Sorak Tva, the 42, uh, the 42nd house on Bratsky Street. When the Rebbe first moved to Rostov, he moved to an apartment on Pushkinskaya, which if you look at this street, you go all the way to the end of the street, it's Pushkinskaya. That was the first apartment the Rebbe rented. When they first came, they went to a hotel for several days, and then they moved to the first apartment. There's a story how the owner of the apartment wasn't so fond of Chassidim coming, to say the least. So it was a very difficult time for the Rebbe Rashab. They moved into a second apartment, and then eventually they bought this building. And after half a year of renovations of this building, they moved in in 1918, Tishrei of 1918. What's special, if you notice, there's a very big gate to this house. 
something that most of the houses around here don't have. If you look at the houses across the street, they don't have these big gates. Why does this have a big gate? This was considered a house of the rich people, the wealthy, as carriages and horses were able to come in here. And it was a special house that was really something the Rebbe Rashab needed, and I'll explain why. So when you come into this house, you'll notice there's a big uh, courtyard with walls outside. And it's something that's very special because uh, moving in that time, think about this, 1918. You're talking about the time of the revolution, the time of great uncertainty here. It was very difficult. The Rebbe Rashab wanted to build a mikvah. And to build a mikvah, you need to have a house that you're able to have the oitzer, you're able to have the water coming down without anyone seeing. So that's why this uh, house is unique. If you look around, there's a wall around the house and uh, there's no problems with neighbors or anything else. So they bought this house. It was considered a special house, a big house. You can actually see right here on the wall, there's a, uh, a fence. But that used to be the gate, the entranceway to this house. And uh, we assume that this is what was here in 1916, 1915, 1918, 1920, when the Rebbe Rashab lived here. So uh, to look at this house, you have two parts of the house. You have this part of the house here, which is where the Rebbe Rashab, the Friedrich Rebbe lived in this part of the house, the Echidus room, the Farbrengen room, the Beis Medrash. Then you have this part of the house, which is where Rabbi Lambda, the Chsidim, the secretaries lived in this part of the house. So when the house was bought back by Tzach, um, they knew that there was a mikveh here somewhere, but don't know where the mikveh was. So um, the chassidim that were here as, ch as children back in the day, they said they remember that the mikveh was under the kitchen. But how do you know where the kitchen is? How could you figure out? It's, it's, the house was built in 1870, right? So in 1920, the kitchen was somewhere. How do you know where the kitchen is today? Uh, to be able to look under there to see if the mikveh is there. So they went, they looked in archival documents in the city archive, and they saw that the kitchen used to be right there. So if the kitchen was theirs, then it has to be under somewhere in the basement. And they went down into the basement, and that's where they discovered the famous first Lubavitch mikvah in the world, the mikvah that was built according to the instructions of the Rebbe Rashab, the Bora Gabi Bor mikvah. You can see here, actually, uh, where the water comes. The water comes down from there. And it comes in these uh, pipes here that are the original pipes and it goes in here and that's how it went down into the mikvah. If you see here these stones right here in this uh, little cage, they're the stones that were from the mikvah. When they, when they found the mikvah, some stones broke, they wanted to keep them, so they put them there aside. Um, we'll go take a look at the mikvah. The mikvah is right here. It was discovered by the shliach in Rostov, Rabbi Eliashev Kaplon together uh, with the floor. This here. Hello? Okay. So, uh, this is the mikvah right here. So they came into this room and this was a basement. There was nothing here dirt on the ground, they started, you know, moving what was on the floor, and they uncovered the first step right here, this is the first step, they uncovered the first step, the second step, the third step, and they realized this was the mikvah. The most amazing thing that was found here was that when they dug it all up, they found that the bar, the water, the rainwater, if you look in the corner of the mikvah, that was covered with a stone, and there was still water in there when they found this. So imagine, the mikvah was sitting here empty for 70 years, and then they find right in there that there's still water from the times of uh, the Friedrich Rebbe. This mikvah was used by the Rebbe Rashab, the mikvah was used by the Friedrich Rebbe, and the mikvah was used by the Rebbe that came here in the times that the Friedrich Rebbe was here. So it's an amazing house to have such a mikvah here, and, uh, and it's uh, historic, the first Lubavitch mikvah. Okay. Looking at this house, um, we'll take a look now. Rabbi Mendel Morozov came here to visit. And when he came here to visit, it was interesting. I was told that he, he entered from the main gate and he saw people walking into the side door. This side door is the door where the Rebbe Rashad and the Friedrich Rebbe lived. 
So when Mendel Marazor, Mendel Marazor came in, he saw that. He was taken aback. He was saying, how could you? This, it's the Rebbe Rashab's house. It's a friggin' no one goes in there. He remembers as a child. This was off balance. And this is the place right here. This is the this is personal living quarters. The Yechidus from the Rebbe Rashab. Let's take a look. We have here... Здрасте, Лиза. Здрасте. Живи здоровы. Привет. Привет. А просто снимаю вот живой. Я сейчас вот вернусь к вам. Он снимает вот меня вот. Um, so here is the. Uh, this is where the Friedrich Rebbe lived down here. Obviously, this is renovated, so there's not much to see here today. Uh, when there was the yeshiva here, this was the dining room. We're gonna come back here soon. Um, is it just that you have to So the Rebbe Rashab, the Chilis room, and the room where the Rebbe Rashab lived in, the Rebbe Tzin is right up here. I think it's right now. Lived, the Rebbitson lived, their personal quarters, two rooms. <laughs> These two rooms were the Rebbe Rashab's and the Rebbitson's personal quarters. And if you heard the story when the Rebbe Rashab was nostalgic, he has to be taken to the yeah. Zal. The Zal was this room, which, which was basically to be taken from here into this room, the Achilles room. Right he was asked to be taken into this room. This is the Yechidus room. This is, uh, you can actually take a look here at the entrance. There's uh, some nails, original nails that were here when they found the house right here and right there from the times of uh, the Rebbe Rashad. So the Rebbe Rashad had one picture taken of him when he uh, was planning, he needed to get a visa, they were planning to go to Georgia. And the picture of the Rebbe Rashad is with this uh, wallpaper in the background. So this is the original wallpaper from the time of the Rebbe Rashad. You can also look part of the ceiling here. That was the original ceiling in the time of the Rebbe Rashad. The Rebbe Rashad asked to be taken to this room exactly 100 years ago. Bez Nissen, the Rebbe Rashad asked to be taken to this room and this is what the Rebbe Rashad said. That uh, I'm going to heaven and I'm leaving you the Chsavim. And uh, this is the message that we live with, a message that's important to us, that we connect to the Rebbe, to the Nasi Rebbe, to the Ksavim, to learning the Rebbe's Sikhis, the Rebbe's Maimorim, the Rebbe's uh, letters. That's a lesson to each and every one of us. So this is the historic room of uh, Yechidus. It was a big room. People were coming from one side. They go out the other side. And this is the room that was known as the Farbrengen room. So this room that the Rebbe Rashab and the Friedrich Rebbe, they'd have for bringing, so that's the little uh, base medrash you can actually see here. So that the Rebbe Rashab used to really sit right over here. The Rebbe Rashab would sit here. And this is where everything took, uh, took place in this small little room. And there was a passageway between this room to the other side of the house, which is where the Chassidim lived. So you go through from this room. So we see where the Rebbe Rashab was in Stalik and here is a video. Um, this was you know, 100 years that Eber Shah was right during COVID. But this is uh, from the oil of Eber Very close. That today we should be able to be there to see the Rebbe Lematam Sarat Fahim, Be'ene Basar, Vehu Igalenu. Here's this is on Bez Nissen by the oil of the Rebbe Rashab in Rustav. He's the second law of the uh, I want to share and to share a few last words with you. I want to share a few last words. Shabbos here, as you can see, in about a half an hour, 40 minutes, Shabbos is beginning. 
And I wanted to share a few words. I hear from many people that now is a time that we have to have Mesir Snefesh. Everyone's having Mesir Snefesh. For some people, they consider Mesir Snefesh, they have to stay at home all day. For other people, Mesir Snefesh, they can't work. For other people, Mesir Snefesh is not going to a minion or not going to mikvah. You know, I moved to Rostov on Shlokas 11 years ago. And in the 11 years I've been here, I've realized that the Mesir Snefesh, the Yidin here have had always and have today is something that cannot be compared to anything else in the world. When I first moved here, people asked why I was moving here. I said, we have to go inspire, we have to go encourage, we have to bring the Rebbe's light all over. But for the past 11 years, it's become clear that more than Shluchim and Russia inspire the local Russian, Taira Yidin, they inspire us. I want to share with you, you signed the oil. I, I tried showing that right next to the Rebbe Rashab is, uh, is uh, the Matseva of Rabbi Shmuel Garari. Um, we have some other people here that are buried next to the Rebbe Rashab. These are people that were Moisir Nefesh, had real mysterious Nefesh for the Yanim of the Rebbe Rashab. So I want to share with you, you know, um, we had, we had um, today on Beis Nissen, the Moyal was supposed to come to Rostov. Because a few Yidin, a few young people, there was a 35-year-old young man, there was another person, a few bunch of people wanted to come and do a bris on this special day. One of them even told me he had a secret that he waited. He was ready to do it a month and a half ago, but he wanted to wait for Beis Nissen. Why? Because he wanted to take the name Shalom Dog there, the Rebbe Rashab's name. So he called me Matzi Shabbos as things were getting difficult, and it was clear that it wasn't what, what, what's going to happen because the Moyel come. And he told me, Chaim, please call the Moyel. Tell me if the Moyel could come here for Beis Nissen. If not, I'm going to fly to him. So I told him, we can't come. We can't go to him. He can't come here. What bothers this Yid, his name is Sergei, what bothers Sergei is that on Bayes Nissen, his Monsieur Snefesh is that he cannot do a bris. The Monsieur Snefesh is not that he could do it, it's that he cannot do a bris. So today is a time that we have to think, now is a time, what is the Monsieur Snefesh we choose for ourselves? Every generation has its Monsieur Snefesh. The Yidin who lived here, the Chassidim who lived here 100 years ago, had tremendous Monsieur Snefesh. I want to share with you one story, and we'll walk for that to show you the story. The, the, I'm taking a there was a chassid that lived in, in Rostov in 1918. This is when the revolution took place. This is the chassid of the Rebbe Rashab by the name of Remort Chalifshitz. He has many grandchildren or shluchim. He has uh, a good chaber of ours, Rabbi Fremel Lakshin is his grandson. So Remort Chalifshitz, as things were getting difficult here in 1918, he went to the Rebbe Rashab and he told the Rebbe Rashab, I want to leave Rostov. You have to realize this at the time, it wasn't Lubavitch here. Rostov was always considered a bit of a gullus from Lubavitch, or the first gullus from Lubavitch. It was a difficult time, and he came to the Rebbe, and he said, Rebbe Rashab, I want to leave. The Rebbe Rashab didn't tell him, don't leave. The Rebbe Rashab didn't tell him that you should leave. The Rebbe Rashab told him, if you leave, who's going to stay behind? That's all the Rebbe Rashab told this cousin, this younger man, in 1918. A time of great upheaval. A time the revolution was going on. There was a war between all the different people here. Now, what did Mordechai Lifshitz do? Remotel, as they called him. In Tavresh Pei, the Rebbe Rashab was nostalgic, and he stayed in Rostov. The Friedrich Rebbe was Mechabal Messias here in Rostov, and like I showed, there was a video that showed the Rebbe Rashab's house. You were, you were able to take a look at it. It was something yesterday I just did for one of the schools. You could see the Friedrich Rebbe's house, the Rebbe Rashab's house, where the Friedrich Rebbe was Mechabal Messias, the mikvah. So... The Friedrich Rebbe left four years later and Ramatul Lifshitz stayed in Rostov. The Nazis came to Rostov in 1942. They killed every single Jew living in the city. Not a single Jew stayed behind, was left behind after the Nazis. It's, it's known as the Babi Yar of Russia. Zmyovskaya Balka. The Snake's Valley, they call it. Martche went, evacuated, and he came back to Rostov. And he was here, the last Chosid, he was here, the last Lubavitcher. And he was here until 1968 when he passed away. Here, by the way, is the Matseva of Rav Nassim Garari. Another chassid was Mosra Belev and Nefesh to the Rebbe Rashab. Jesse Sternberg, if you're watching. So this Motel Livshitz, why am I telling you about him? Because he could have left. There were years there was no kosher meat in Rostov. There was year, years that there was not food, that you couldn't get kosher food here. But he stayed in Rostov because the Rebbe Rashab told him, he didn't tell him, don't leave. He didn't tell him, you must stay here. He didn't tell him, your shlichas is here. He wasn't a shliach. The Rebbe Rashab told him, if you leave, who's going to stay behind? 
dear friend, this is the Matseva of Rav Mark Chalikshu. I apologize, I made a mistake. He passed away in 1969. Come, please show it. In 1969, Rav Mark passed away and he's buried right here, two Matsevas away from the Rebbe Rashab, a person who had a Messiah Snefesh to fulfill the Rebbe's directives. We also have to choose what Messiah Snefesh we have today. We could choose that our Messiah Snefesh is going to be to sit at home with the family and kids all day. We could choose that our Messiah Snefesh is going to be that we can't earn the money that we need or want, and that's going to be our Messiah Snefesh. We could choose that the Messiah Snefesh is that we can't go to a Pesach hotel this year that we, like we planned. We could choose the Messiah Snefesh is that I'm not in Rostov today. I'm based, listen, I have tickets. I had a hotel booking. That could be our Messiah Snefesh. We could choose the Messiah Snefesh that Pesach, we can't have guests, or I can't be with my parents, or they can't come to me. Or we could choose right now in business, and as it's coming to a close in Rostov, we could choose that our Messiah Snefesh is going to be to be Besimcha. Our Messiah Snefesh is going to be Besimcha so that Mashiach should come. So that Mashiach should come and we shouldn't just pray now for Rafua Shlema. And then next week we go back to regular life and everything's back, business as usual. That's not enough. We want that. That should absolutely happen. And our next week it should happen today. But what we want today is we want that Mashiach should come. Our Mashiach's nefesh should be that we should find a way inside our souls, inside our neshamas, that we should be besimcha. We should be besimcha. That should bring the geula. And we should be able to celebrate together very soon. Usually I invite people. You know, when I lived in California, I invite people to come visit us. And every Shabbos, we'd have guests. And our stuff has been a little more difficult. Last year on Beis Nissen, we had an amazing group of Anash from Pomona, led by Moishi Rubin. We had, uh, we had an amazing group, Rabbi Demberg from, uh, from Boca. It was an amazing group that came and gave us a lot of chizuk. This year, Beis Nissen has been different. This year, we didn't have any guests. We didn't have any people. When Shluchim come, when people come visit us, any Anash... And they, they come here traveling all the way here. It gives tremendous chizak tatsa shluchim. This year we don't have that. This year we have to find the chizak inside our neshama. And our focus and our goal has to be that we have to take the nishayin. We have to take the mysterious nefesh of fighting for Mashiach to come. Because if Mashiach comes, the refu is going to be there. Everything is going to be there. This is what the Rebbe fought for. These were the last words that the Rebbe gave us. The last mission to each and every one of us. There wasn't a mission to shluchim. It was a mission to every single Jew, every single Anash member, every single Lubavitcher, that we have to fight to bring Mashiach. We have to go back to the forefront of the lines to lead, to, to, to lead and to, 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 to push for this. And in Mitzvah Shev, which will be Zeichel, before Shabbos ends, Mashiach should come, we should meet together in a beautiful far bringing together in Yerushalayim, Yerach Kodesh, Bimeir of Yamenu. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, and of course, thank you to uh, Rabbi Danziger. And, um,